Hello everybody and welcome to Chop and Brew. It's a very special occasion. For one, Paul Snack Stick Fowler over here. We're in his backyard I'm drinking some of his beer. We just polished off some snack sticks. It is, what is it? What's today? Batch 100. <laughs> Paul Fowler's 100th batch of homebrew. How many years does it take? Five years. Five years. Five years last month. I started Father's Day of 2012. Oh, no joke. Yep. So we're brewing a big beer for the occasion. We're going to tell you all about that. We're going to kind of look back at Paul's first 100. Not every beer one at a time, but just yeah. some. We're going to gleam across some highlights. Um, we're going to eat some pizza. He's going to smoke some pork butts. It's going to be a great night. So stick with us. Chop for chop. Brew for brew. Happy 100. Thank you, dude. <laughs> So Paul, tell the people what you have on your agenda for Brew 100. Big number, gonna be a big beer. Courage Russian Imperial Stouts on deck today. Um, I was fortunate enough to have this at some club at a club meeting. I'm part of the St. Paul Homebrewers, and some members there made the beer. I thought it was fantastic. I said it's got to be that one. What what is the beer like? <laughs> Boy, it the was, ones you've had. The ones I've had were different, of course, because everybody's brew system. You're yeah. gonna kick out a different beer. But they were rich, um, chocolatey, co coffee to it, um, huge amounts of uh, mouthfeel. But yet, being 10 or plus percent, it wasn't like boozy or alcoholic. The blog uh, shut up about Barclay Perkins, where Paul got this. It's um, it's the Imperial or it's the Imperial Stout, or they just called it Imperial, uh, from Courage Brewery. What I like about this is it's not just big boozy multi it's actually crazy hoppy oh yeah right uh tell us about the hops that are going to go into this mofo we got it's let's see it's a two hour boil to begin with two hour mash prior to that scaled up to six and a half gallons i got three and a half ounces of fuggles going in for two hours <laughs> and then i got three and a half ounces of halo tower going in the last 30 minutes and then it gets dry hopped with and a quarter ounce. A fuggle, which I love. A fuggle. Uh, I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot. It, actually, it does sound like a lot of hops, but since they're low alpha, it kind of doesn't. But then when you add back in how long they're going to be in there, right? it's going to be a beautiful thing. Uh, so you've already mashed in. We're in the middle of this two hour mash. Yeah. Tell us about the grain bill on this guy. Grain bill was just scaled up to that size. It was almost 24 pounds for my system. I went with full amount of mirror solder. I went with crisp brown malt and crisp black English malt. And it's already smelling really good. I mean, almost the second it hit the yeah. mash water, it started smelling like a coffee, ch chocolate espresso. biscuit. The notes from Kristen's original historic recipe say dark, blackish brown and syrupy, Madeira, rum raisins, port, black cherries, hints of treacle and cocoa, pipe tobacco and walnut, tannic, drying character, deep and rich drying, finish that lingers for ages words do not do this beer justice Kristen England loves this beer he says somewhere in here I believe he says this is the best imperial stout that's ever been so wow. how are you gonna what's the aging the fermentation and the aging regimen here um well what I'm gonna do is ferment it I'm gonna give it a good three weeks to ferment out and then uh, if if the gravity doesn't change towards the end at all if it's done done then I'm going to keg half of it and just cold storage for a while and the other half I want to bottle condition so I can have those bottles around for years which would be a first for me 100 batches I've never bottled anything <laughs> oh seriously all keg <laughs> okay which leads me into what I kind of really want to talk about over 100 batches we were kind of rapping about this in my backyard last week or earlier this week you haven't really taken the traditional route right through home brewing that a lot of us do extract partial mash bottling yeah bottling <laughs> then maybe a keg and then maybe you brew in a bag or all grain tell the people kind of how you went through like you went when you went in you went in 
Yeah, um, I was introduced to homebrewing from a co-worker and he brought me a beer and I thought it was okay and then some time passed and he brought me another one and he was just like, wow, this beer is as good as anything I've ever bought. So that really put the bug in me. Some time passed, I thought, well, maybe I want to give this a try. Bought a book, uh, How to Brew by John Palmer. Couldn't get enough information. I read, 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 read for a long time. And uh, it was about three months of reading before I actually brewed my first batch, made my own kegel. I did a uh, full volume boil with uh, extract for my first batch with a starter on a stir plate. Um, so I did three extract batches and then I went right to brew in a bag and I think I did about 70 batches in brew in a bag. And then I switched over to this uh, recirculating mash batch sparge that I'm doing now. Yeah, we'll have some video of your current setup so explain to us kind of how this works. Uh, the recirculating mash, uh, the whole time you're mashing and I'm recirculating the wort through the grain bed um, with a very low flame on the bottom to maintain that temp, which does a couple things. It's, it's clarifying the wort the whole time. So when I run off, it's, it's crystal clear. The temp is really easy to maintain that way. And you could also do set mashes really easy this way. Um, you could part a guile if you wanted to. I mean, it, the, it opened up more possibilities for me this way than brewing a bit. Not that that's a bad way to brew. Unlike me, who rarely re-brews something from my catalog, you rebrew a lot. You're big on process. You've got the awards to show it, so apparently it's a good idea. But you really like to dial in yeah. and perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about kind of why and where you start when you're um, tweaking. Um. There's a few beers I, I brew every year. Um, I always brew my lemon blonde. I'm, I'm harvesting my yeast from that. I always brew like an oatmeal stall in the fall. Some of these beers, you know, like pale ales, I'm brewing these things all the time. One, because I really enjoy those beers. Uh, two, while they may be pretty good, you can always make them a little better. Um, you could enter something into a contest and you get feedback and use that feedback to improve that thing. So as far as uh, tweaking them to improve them, don't change too many things at once. You know, don't change four things and expect to know that those things made a difference. Uh, three and a half ounces of Fuggles for the two hour boil. So 100, 120 minute edition. Just change one thing at a time. You got, you can re-brew re it again if it's not where you want it. You can always do it again, do it again. And doing that, it's gonna make you a better brewer. You really dial in your your process, your, I mean, you'll hit your numbers better, and all that stuff. If you keep changing beers every single time, you're not really... Have you ever freestyled a beer? Have you uh, ever been in the middle that of... That one. <laughs> okay, tell us what this... This is the two-track pail. That's the two-track pail. I just got some free malt. I had some leftover hops, and I said, well, I'm going to put this and this and throw these hops in here. And But by freestyle, I bet this means it was still in brewing software. It was. It was still very, like... I guess what I meant is, have you ever been halfway through a brew day Oh. And gone to the spice rack and been like, hmm, that's not really in your wheelhouse, right? The only thing I could ever say I did that with was uh, the lemon blonde I make every year. Well, that was a blonde ale. I never brewed it before, but I was like, I'm just going to try this. Okay. But I did plan it ahead. I'm like, I think I'm going to just try this. Planned chaos. <laughs> planned chaos. Paul Fowler's Throw planned it in chaos. There. If there wasn't enough going on right now, my wife talked me into doing some pulled pork for a graduation. So I got three butts in the smoker. This morning I rubbed them down with some Dizzy Pig, coarse grind, original seasoning. Let them sit till about five o'clock tonight and put them in. They'll be done sometime tomorrow. I'm um, giving them five hours of smoke. Then I'm gonna pull them out of that smoker, bring them upstairs and put them in the oven at 250 degrees and they can finish in there. That way I can have that smoker clean, done, put away. I don't have to worry about it. I can go to bed, they can keep cooking. I'll wake up in the morning and done. I can deal with it then. I don't have to be up all night tending a fire or charcoal or anything else. So the true barbecue people might shun me, but they like it. <laughs> so I'll make it that way. What are some tips you think or some advice almost kind of along those lines even uh, that you would suggest that you've kind of maybe learned the hard way or just learned along the way? Don't be afraid to try something new. Uh, don't get stuck in a rut just doing one thing but don't be afraid to rebrew something either. Knowing your system, I think, is huge. 
don't be afraid to make starters. Starters aren't a big deal. They definitely make better beer. And uh, join a club. The, the advice you can get from other people or just friends or anybody that you know ha has a pretty good palate is invaluable because they could probably pick up on things that maybe you're blind to. Any brews kind of stand out, uh, whether because you like them a lot or the reaction that someone had to it, where you like blew your own mind? There's been a couple, I can't really think of any off the top of my head, but uh, the ones that, that does come to mind are, are simple recipes. I mean, there's not much to them. Yeah. Maybe two malts and one hop and yeast, and it comes out, wow, this is... So it doesn't have to be the kitchen sink of malts and 15 hops. It could be two hops and three malts or yeah. simple. Even like this one you're doing today, three malts, two hops, a lot of the processes are unique as far as mm -hmm. that length of boil, length of mash. Yeah. But again, that's a process thing right. that makes it clean, hopefully. Yeah, it's going to add some flavor, that long boil, that's going to develop a lot of flavor. All right, man. Cheers, dude. Cheers. Chop for chop. Brew for brew. Oh, one for the brothers. Yeah, man. <laughs> one for the 99. Yeah. Peace. So here we are, Don Osborne's backyard. It is almost two months since brew day. Seven weeks, yeah. Seven weeks, says Seven the weeks. statistician. <laughs> we brewed on July 10th. It is September 2nd? Yep. Sweet. So we wanted to do a tasting because uh, in the video we kind of mentioned that maybe we wouldn't drink on it too early. We would age it more than anything, but uh, we were at Paul's the other night for a brew session and randomly cracked one of his bottle conditioned bottles open and it was tasting lovely. So we thought mm -hmm. we should not pass up the opportunity to do a quick tasting note follow up to wrap up this episode, get the recipe out there for people to brew this winter and age for a while. So cheers. 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 Enjoy. Is there anything you want to say? You know, the last time we saw you in the episode, you hadn't even killed boil and you're standing next to a yeast starter. Is there anything you want to say real quick about um, fermentation of a beer this big? Anything new that happened in your... Yeah, my experience in 100 brews, I've never had to like coax anything along. Like, <laughs> come on, finish. It's always been done like 10 days in and I usually get it out of there by day 12, 13. Um, this one, 14 days in, it was at 1036 from a starting gravity of 1093. Mm. It was supposed to be at 1028, predicted. Yeah. So I wound up bumping up to 1072 and rousing yeast every day for about a week, and I got it to drop about six points. So, what do you think? Two months in, it's drinking wonderful. It's not hot, it's not muddled. I feel like it's a kind of like Don said, it's a dry roasty i get a little bit of like charcoal char a mm -hmm. little bit of licorice on the nose and then on the sensation almost like this kind of cold like icy hot feeling on the tongue from that kind of um licorishness yeah. I, I compared it to like chocolate covered uh or sea salt chocolates yeah because it yep. does have a minerally saltness to it yeah i have a couple of people in the club made this and everybody's version is just a little bit different but i I'm really happy with the way this turned There's out. There's some black licorice character and coffee in the sense of a dark roasted coffee, a uh, espresso, a French mm -hmm. roast, maybe mm -hmm. that type of burnt uh, black character. And that, that would have been an interesting question if I would have had to guess the final gravity because it's not a 1030 beer you would think would be fairly sweet depending on what beer it is, but yeah. it isn't drinking very sweet. No, it's not even drinking particularly thick either mm -mm. it's no. neither of those things that's, that's why i kind of was like we got to drink this on camera before because you would think that some of those things would be happening and it would need some time to find itself yeah. but we we're having this little debate as we were tasting right before we turned the camera on whereas i think this is ibus in its young stage battling that sweetness don thinks it might be the brown malt and the black patent which is something that'll never fade so you're kind of saying theoretically this won't get sweeter seeming as it ages Whereas I think it kind of will, because IBUs fade, but malt flavor doesn't, so... No, it changes. Um, the IBUs, I think, are in the 60s, and, yep. you know, for a beer of 1093, I mean, that's, you know, you could make a... I, I, if you were to make a Sierra Nevada Bigfoot clone, I would imagine it's a barley wine, but I imagine your IBUs are yeah. higher yeah. than 60. Yeah. That That is a bitter, Maybe bitter right. beer. Maybe the... And you drink that beer when it's fresh, and you are... 
drilled with the hops. You're smacked with them. Yeah. You're slapped around with them. You this, also drilled this, after you drink this, it. This is, you know, this is not, it's not doing that, and that's not a knock against it. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. It is interesting how drinkable it is. I, I love that it tastes months. this good two months in. Yeah, for being such a big beer. I mean, it is. So many Imperial Stouts. It, this is in that realm, even though we're talking about, like we said, way mid 1900s version of Imperial Stout versus what we're all used to at like Darkness, Dark Lord, Abyss. I mean, this doesn't drink. This drinks like. A working man's imperial stout where he doesn't want to mess around with aging it like he wants to go to the pub after Enjoy working it. on that ship and get lit <laughs> and not be like oh but what temperature should my cellar be at for how long <laughs> this saying, is for a guy that ain't talking saying about chris england beer. would approve of this it's a chris england recipe so. yeah it <laughs> is yeah well, okay, that's there hilarious you, go. you didn't know you that this. no i didn't know that. <laughs> it's he and ron funny. pattinson joined no it is like yeah. uh barclay perkins kind of it is you know, it's from 19 kind of thing. yeah that's funny 1914 well there Kurtz. you go no i didn't know that but it is uh your grandfather drank a better imperial stout than you did you do <laughs> it's not so yeah know. right it's not your imperial stout i can't wait to see what it turns into Usually you say it's not your grandfather's imperial stout. No, this is. This is your grandfather's imperial <laughs> stout. And drink it instead of that hot, syrupy mess that you're buying. I look forward to seeing what happens to this, you know, drink it over the holidays after New Year. But as far as drinking a young stout, this is on point. The Maybe. Fuggle, the Hallertau, I think it was. It's just, it's none of these like crazy hops. It's just like hop creating a foundation for brown and black malt. Nothing in there is getting too sweet. It's bone dry. But you can still drink an imperial pint of it and go bone out singing. Bone dry. <laughs> I don't think a 1030 beer has ever been called yeah, bone it's dry. It's relatively before. bone dry. I don't know what they call bone dry. It's nice. Really nice. It is very nice. I guess it's bone dry versus what I was expecting when you yeah. hear imperial yeah. style these days. So Paul's episode is going to be up on the website, chopbrew.com slash recipes. It's Paul's recipe. It's Chris England's. It's Courage. Uh, it's Pattinson. It's a group effort. It's a collaborative recipe of sorts but we're gonna put his up we'll also hyperlink all the inspirational blog posts and such so i'm out of beer we got to go help yeah, don with the surly as well h work H-A rally work rally gotta here kick that, that keg clean get that, that stuff beer on tap yeah man. <laughs> all right cheers cheers, cheers. chop for chop brew for brew how's that going <laughs> bitter <laughs> chocolate for bitter <laughs> chocolate <laughs>